if you are sort of used to thinking about the future, thinking probabilistically, kind of accepting that you're going to be wrong, you're, you're better able, I think, to take those difficult decisions in the teeth of a crisis and keep your rebalancing going. Welcome to the Podfolio, Willis Towers Watson's investment podcast series, where we'll give you an update on the latest developments across global markets and talk to expert guests on hot topics that matter to institutional investors and their portfolios. Hello and welcome to the Portfolio Podcast with me, your host, Locke Marr. First of all, welcome to 2021. And now we've called this episode New Year, New You, because this is, of course, the time of year to make some new resolutions for how we run our lives. But should we also take a moment to think about how we run our portfolios and make some resolutions to do things better there? That's our theme for today. And I have three esteemed guests joining me. Martin Jex, who leads on our macroeconomic views and how these are then fed into investment portfolios. So welcome to the show, Martin. Hello, Locke. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Tessa Mann, who is an equity portfolio strategist. So welcome, Tessa. Thank you, Locke. And we also welcome back Katie Sims, who is our head of multi-asset growth and also, of course, the silky voice you hear at the beginning of each episode introducing our podcast. (laughs) Great to be back. Thanks, Locke. In this episode, we'll be taking a look ahead to the rest of 2021 and beyond, thinking about the forces that would influence world markets and how we can allow for these in our portfolios. Before we do that, though, there is a tiny cynical voice in my head that says why make these predictions when the world is just so inherently unpredictable and i I just want to address that first so turning to you first katie we've just come out of the year 2020 a year that as we all know brought incredible upheaval to the world and not just the investment market so so i just want to quickly revisit the predictions and and portfolio suggestions that we made this time last year and then think about whether those turned out to be any use uh you know what did that experience teach us about trying to second guess the future if you like sure well i think if anybody managed to predict 2020 with any accuracy then they won't need to be listening to this podcast and (laughs) looking for recommendations from us um, yeah, I, I don't think anybody uh, sort of went into the year expecting the roller coaster ride that that we uh, inevitably experienced with markets. Um, but what we did get right um, in terms of our expectations was that there is scope for there to be significant market volatility, um, and that you should bear that in mind when you are considering the risks and opportunities when building a portfolio. So you know, a, a number of the things that we have been um, consistently advocating, such as having lots of diversity in portfolios and thinking about things that you might want to own in the case in the event that markets do sell off, they really came good during the course of Q1. So, um, you know, hedge funds were by and large up across the board. Um, our portfolios were up between 8 and 17%. Um, and we also had employed some explicit downside risk protection, which um, had generated fantastic outcomes. So again, between 50 and 150% returns on those things. So I think, you know, having an eye on the potential risks and impact that they might have is important at, for any investor at any stage in their journey and and so uh, that risk management process is is well worth embedding in how you think about things so now let's look ahead to what's to come Uh, so generally speaking given where we are now how optimistic are you guys feeling about the world economy in the coming months and years yeah generally we're relatively optimistic so what we have learned is once public health related restrictions ease and we can see that it's likely that the vaccine will allow for that, then economic recovery can be pretty rapid. So it is obviously worth noting, as you say, there's a lot of unpredictability here and a lot of things that need to go right in order for that that economic recovery to continue. But that's certainly where the evidence is pointed. 
at this stage. And so, Tessa, I mean, what, what are for you the, the main forces that will be driving our markets in the future months? So I think certainly at this crucial juncture that the economy's at now, it really is policy mix to start with. So we need to have more accommodative policy. Um, again, as I said, kind of the evidence is pointing that way with, you know, a lot of willingness and ability from central banks and governments to continue with that. Um, so part of that is keeping bond yields low, for example, um, and also continuing to provide that com combined monetary and fiscal support that we've begun to see. Um, but I think for us as well, China's financial opening is very important to investors. So I was living in, in Hong Kong until recently. Oh, and I, didn't know, I didn't know that. You know, I, you know I'm from Hong Kong. I, I okay. didn't know you. Yeah, yeah, cool. Until, uh, we need to swap notes. Yeah, late 2019. So I think from that vantage point, you really can see um, just, well, firstly, the rapid opening up of China and really how much of a kind of gravity it is in, in the kind of Asian centre there um, and how that can be also underestimated somewhat from the, the West. Um, but yeah, there's kind of the scale there, the banking assets of around $40 trillion, around double um, that in the US. So as this opens up, that's going to have big implications for investors. Um, and I think the final thing, Locke, would just be long-term sustainability. So something that a lot of us are discussing now, particularly how we transition to a lower carbon economy. Yeah, so we've got these three broad themes you know you've got the policy shift you've got the rise of china uh, as a as a kind of global power and you've got the theme of sustainability uh, let me now turn to you martin uh, can, can you just tell us a bit more about the the process of translating these themes into kind of practical changes in how we actually invest i mean these i guess new year portfolio resolutions that i described yeah, I mean, I suppose the first thing to say is we, we're sort of constantly trying to do that. Real-time portfolio management means that, you know, you need constantly to be reviewing what you've got. But more formally, we go through your process of, you know, what's my resolutions for the next year um, every December. Um, and as we were doing that last December, obviously there's masses to talk about. But the big thing that that struck us was that 2020 does seem to us to be a bit of a watershed year in that the trends that were happening that were ongoing in a kind of a slow burn sort of way pre-2020, some of those have just been accelerated by the COVID shock. And I think the, the ones that Tessa was talking about there are prime example examples. And that's really what we're focusing on in the report we're just about to release. So the Outlook 2021, we're taking those key three themes that Tessa talked about and, and figuring out what what the big portfolio implications, what the big portfolio resolutions um, of those themes might be. And if that's OK, I'd like to just go through some of these actions uh, just so we get a better feel for what we mean. Um, does it work if I if I take these themes kind of one at a time? Uh, so if we if we start thinking about that idea of a future policy shift, so so this idea of governments around the world putting more money into the system, trying to kickstart our post-COVID recovery. What, what might that mean for future returns, first of all? So in the near term, it's likely we'll have a bit more of the same. So more of what we saw last year. And without going full geek on you, more of what we've seen since 2008. So quantitative easing, keeping bond yields low, um, pushing investors across the risk spectrum. Um, and pushing up valuations. Longer term, we can see it's much, you know, it's very likely that valuation increases can pull down returns from the future. So you can almost imagine you're borrowing those returns from the future. Um, there is elements of devaluing currencies relative to financial assets. Um, but even in spite of that, you know, it's it's most likely that we'll see kind of stronger nearer term returns and, you know, over the longer term that pulls the return profile down a little bit. So I might I might not be kind of putting in quite the right way, Tessa, but it kind of 
seems to suggest an, an approach of make hay whilst the sun shines. Um, it's, it's not the kind of thing that I remember us saying very much uh, in the past. So I just want to test how strong is your conviction about this idea that of, of kind of stronger near term returns, lower longer term returns that you would actually change the way you invest and, and maybe take a little more risk now? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I would say for the right investors, a medium conviction, if that uh, kind of clarifies somewhat. Yeah. So, yeah, as we said earlier, or as I kind of mentioned, this this is our base case, but we do recognise there's quite a few things that do need to go right for this to happen. Um, so it's dependent on policy stance, for example, which, you know, we're, we're kind of listening to the forward guidance and looking at what's been happening. Um, but that's that's obviously a key risk, for example. Um, so yeah, we're fairly confident. Wouldn't bet the ranch, as it were. Sure. Yeah. And I, I, if I can just butt in, Lock, I think the the clear implication here is that you know if you've got the right level of governance and kind of execution ability to be dynamic and keep you know that that judgment under review, then I think medium conviction, take a bit more risk. Don't bet the ranch, as Tessa says on it. I think that's that that's what we would suggest. But for many investors, you know, being dynamic just isn't their cup of tea. And in, in which case, uh, I think this this idea of dynamically taking a bit more risk just isn't for you. So that's a kind of general, I think, directional view. Um, in terms of benefiting from the, the stimulus money being thrown around, um, are there any specific sectors or, or asset classes that you're more confident will benefit from the policy shift? Yeah, um, always important question. So I think we've seen in the first instance that Treasury yields clearly come down um, and they're directly bought by central banks. Then we see this go across the risk spectrum, as I mentioned, credit spreads, listed liquid equity, kind of listed assets. Um, but I mean, it's also really worth drawing out that there is there are some differences to the last regime as well. So whilst we we will have the combined impact of a continuation of investors going out along that risk curve I mentioned, um, and we're also looking at policy innovation here where we'll see combined fiscal and monetary policy, which is much more consistent with real economy investment by government agencies. Um, and you know we think that can also, the two of those together, is likely to make more illiquid assets attractive. So illiquid assets being a good asset class to benefit from potentially this kind of movement in money. OK, um, so let's move on to to the second of our three main themes, then, which is the, the rise of China as a global force, um, maybe potentially even the dominant uh, force. Uh, some of our listeners you would have tuned into our previous episode on this topic and, and you know you would have heard our experts arguing for an increase in exposures to Chinese assets and um, turning to you now Martin um are you on the same page on that one yeah definitely and and that's why it features quite prominently in in this report and you know when we were reflecting on our resolutions in December what we were looking for are things that we think are relatively significant like they're, they're going to make a material impact on portfolios and, and also quite certain. I think policy shift, in our view, is both very significant and quite certain. Um, you know, China is, you know, it fits really easily into that those criteria as well. Um, it is obviously just a very large thing, China, as Tess has talked about, the financial system is 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 quite difficult to, to comprehend from a, sometimes, I think, from a Western perspective, it is just really quite, really quite massive. And that is is a technical term. And so as, as it opens up, that is likely to have very significant implications, um, particularly in terms of the opportunity set that that um, non-Chinese investors face. Um, and the other point there is that policymakers have, have reiterated in 2020 their desire to open up the financial system. And policymakers sort of have a habit of of achieving what they set out to in China, at least relative to um to other places in in the western world and so you know I, I do we do think that that financial opening up is is also fairly certain 
Um, so that's, you know, that that's why it deserves such prominence. And and is your yeah go on. Okay, I was just going to offer a thought from an implementation perspective. So if we, I fully agree with Martin's view and therefore we expect um, investors to allocate more capital to Chinese assets. So there's likely to be some price movement um, through that process and it pays to be ahead of the curve um, in terms of anticipating that trend and being a first mover. Yeah, definitely. Get, it, get in early. Yeah. So yeah. do you about taking all of that into account? I mean, do you, is your argument based more around the prospect for better returns or, or is it more about you know diversification and downside protection? I think that where we started from was very much sort of the latter two. So, you know, when we're looking at China, it, it, it is very large and very different to the other markets that we have exposure to. And, and so it was primarily a diversification argument. Um, now with with China bonds being increasingly accessible to us, there's also a downside hedging um, element to it. So, but primarily it did start out um, from a diversification perspective, but I don't think, you know, we can't forget about returns. And Tessa, this is a point you've made to me uh, quite emphatically in the past. Yeah, that's right. I think, as you say, the diversification case is very clear, um, but it's, I find it quite hard to forget just how quickly China is evolving and the opportunity for re return there when the economy is growing so quickly is definitely meaningful. So we've got the fastest rising middle class, for example, in China. And there's, you know, radically reshaping of the economic model with things such as the net zero commitment by 2060. And plus how, how volatile markets are just lends itself quite well to skilled active management as well. And uh, one of the things you, you talked about, Martin, which I picked out was this reference to um, downside risk hedges. Uh, in other words, I think, you know, investments that pay out when the economy runs into difficulties uh, as a kind of a way to protect the portfolio against downside risk. And um, again, I just I just want to do a, a quick look back, if I may. So I, I know we've been talking about these kinds of downside protection strategies for a, not, a while now, perhaps not China necessarily in the past. Um, but can you just very quickly talk about the extent to which some of some of the previous hedges we considered whether they, they did what you expected when things actually got into difficulties last year yeah sure so i mean i think the answer to your question is things did behave roughly as we expected albeit not at the at the precise time um so i think you know katie talked about earlier the various strategies we've got to to cope um with downside risk and, and prominent amongst those is is maxing out diversity and that's really the the first lever we pulled because coming into 2020 we were a little bit concerned about um about risks to asset prices because we felt that the policy regime we're enjoying at the moment which is monetary policy being joined up with fiscal policy you know that that just wasn't present back then and so we were facing a world where cash rates were very low and therefore the ability of monetary policy to sort of absorb any downside shock was limited. So for that reason, we were a little bit worried about that downside. Maxing out diversity was was the first lever we pulled and that, you know, that that worked. Um, I think it, it wasn't an entirely comfortable journey. So particularly when equities and bonds are shooting through the roof as they were in 2019, um, it, it wasn't, you know, supremely uh, comfortable always, but your portfolios did manage to keep pace. And so, you know, I think that's a really good thing. And obviously throughout the crisis, that diversity works. The, the second lever we pulled was holding more bonds. And in fact, we, we held on a, on a leveraged basis. Um, the idea being that when a shock hits, uh, bond yields fall and, and uh, you make a significant return on those investments. And again, that worked, although bond yields actually fell earlier than we were expecting. So we had to be quite, you know, on 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 our toes in terms of exiting those positions. And actually, we, we largely exited those positions before the COVID shock happened. And then the final lever we pulled was was options protection. Um, and that was a little bit reluctantly because, you know, we're not we're not 
certainly not permanent holders of options protection. But if you're worried about the downside and the the cost that you're getting charged um, uh, in holding an option is reasonable, then you know we think you should go for it. And and back back pre COVID. The cost, which is which is directly related to how volatile markets are, the cost was pretty low. So we were able to spend a relatively small amount of of capital and get quite a lot of protection. Um, and so we did that, and it worked pretty well actually. Um, you know, we had to be again pretty uh, quick to react during the crisis, um, but we were we did manage to trade out of those positions, uh, uh, realize a bit of money, and then reinvest that in equities. Um, in the trough so that felt pretty good so those those were the kind of downside risk hedges we had I th- I pre-covid think uh, almost undersold the impact of some of those they were <laughs> they were better than pretty good in the majority of instances but there's there's a a more simple portfolio mechanism that i think gets often gets overlooked um which is rebalancing um mm. i saw a lot of trustees suspending rebalancing through q1 due to to fears around market movements but actually that's exactly the time that you want to be selling assets that have just performed relatively well and buying assets that have performed relatively poorly and, and keeping a cool head and buying back into equities um when it turned out they're at the bottom of the market was an incredibly powerful portfolio management tool that um we were we were also able to make use of yeah that's spot on and i think you know that's really important and it wasn't easy for anyone and i think it sort of comes back to your point earlier around you know what's the point of predictions uh lock i think if 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 you are sort of used to thinking about the future thinking probabilistically kind of accepting that you're going to be wrong you're, you're better able i think to take those difficult decisions in the teeth of a crisis and keep your rebalancing going and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I completely agree with that, Katie. Yeah. And I very agree with, sorry, we're all violently agreeing with each other, but I mean, what you said about being probabilistic about how we look ahead, I think that's really important. It's not about making the right call on what's going to happen. It's doing the right things based on the various probabilities that different scenarios could come to pass. Um, so, okay, so looking looking ahead again then um, to the future period, um, Martin, you've already mentioned exposure to China as perhaps a new form of downside protection. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about you know that one maybe and, and also any others that are worth mentioning for our uh, New Year portfolio resolutions? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, maybe kind of cycling back through these levers we talked about. So, maxing out diversity, I think an implication of, of you know, what Tess is talking about is maybe if you're dynamic, taking a, a little bit more risk, you can maybe ease off on that lever a little bit. But fundamentally, we still think you should hold lots and lots and lots of diversity as much as you can tolerate, because that is just the best single answer we have to the investment problem. Um, the, the bond side of things has become more problematic since um, or US bond yields fell um, in particular, because you know, the, those assets just aren't offering the protection that they were. So we need to look elsewhere. And where we've been looking, um, amongst other places, is is China. So you know, US bond yields at, at the time I'm speaking are about sort of 1% at the 10-year point. Um, China bond yields are significantly above that. And what you know, we're looking at the five-year point, it's around 3%. There's enough depth to those yields uh, to generate some downside protection if those yields fall uh, in a growth shock. And that's the key question. That's what we spent a fair bit of last year looking at. Do we expect Chinese bond yields to fall in a similar way to, say, a US bond yield? And, and that, that, that's all related to how the policy uh, reaction function, how we understand that. And the short answer is we do think that China bond yields will fall to a, to a global growth shock. So I think that's a really interesting and new area of downside protection and then the third lever we talked about with options as i said that the cost of those is, is quite related to how volatile markets are obviously markets have been quite volatile hence the cost has gone up that doesn't mean that you should necessarily disregard options um, i think it's we are facing an uncertain world it's right that those options should be more expensive but they are going to be a less prominent part of the kind of the downside hedging mix Mm-hmm. Um, and finally, then let, let's come to the 
third main theme we had, uh, which is around uh, sustainability. And and within sustainability, I think, you know, climate change is the thing that's really getting a lot of attention. Uh, Kate, Katie, are you are you happy to talk about the, the climate related investment opportunities? Definitely. But, but also the risks as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think we in my previous podcast appearance, we spoke um, at length about climate, but I, I'm happy to give a brief overview of some of the things that we're we're seeing. So yes, I think please. everybody sort of fully bought into the um, rise of renewable energy and therefore the opportunity um, that that presents in terms of investment. So seen many institutional investors committing capital to buying solar farms, um, wind uh, renewables, hydro re renewables. And so that I think that's a commonly accepted way of accessing the climate opportunity. Um, but there is a lot more beyond that. There's scope for thinking um, more broadly about solutions that contribute to the to the problem, whether that's making technology more efficient or even investing in solutions in the fossil fuel industry. If you can um, if you can make um, those sorts of businesses um, behave and, and um, perform more efficiently, then then there is scope to add value there. But some concrete examples of things that we've done recently um, include investing in um, forestry. So actually directly into things that are capturing carbon from the atmosphere and locking it away. That's a very positive, impactful thing to do. And many governments have got um, objectives around trying to to invest into those sorts of areas to to bring down their carbon footprint. Um, we've also invested in uh, charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. Um, we've looked at investments in um, batteries for, you know, if you, if you move more to a renewably uh, generated energy grid, then you, storage becomes more of a problem because you can't just, you know, switch on a coal power station um, or pass the sun to shine so um we you know there's there's a lot of ancillary um solutions that need to be um developed in order to uh, help this uh, climate transition and so there's a lot of scope beyond the obvious things uh, to do in order to invest in opportunities and what about some of the the risks as well yep so i mean i think that the risks are, are relatively well understood in terms of the the overall themes um that where risks are exposed so the idea of stranded assets that um fossil fuel companies own uh, or the the concept of a carbon price um coming in and at what level that ends up being and so how that impacts on different sectors like um travel and for example um but but actually there's there's even more nuance on that because within sectors and within industries there are businesses that are sort of more focused on um their transition and more progressed in doing so and so it requires quite a granular assessment at a stock level to really understand how those risks are going to manifest for each individual business yeah I, I think that's that's the crux of it isn't it and that's the main challenge like we've got and, and actually the entire sort of investment industry has got is kind of is joining up that bottom-up picture kind of aggregating it up and figuring out what that means for um for the assets you hold and that's that's a that's a really big kind of data and analytics challenge and actually for that reason I'm really excited about um, a couple of developments that have happened kind of outside of the investment business at Willis Towers Watson. Um, we've taken on board a couple of analytical teams who are you know do just that. They try and they try and marry those um, kind of idiosyncratic and bottom up factors and aggregate them up and, and try and get a picture of where those risks might emerge given current prices. So I think that's that's you know really quite exciting. So we look forward to seeing the output from that. Um, so th that was climate change, um, which I you know, presume will affect different sectors of the economy differently. Uh, and then on top of that, 
you've got the the recovery from covid which again i think will be experienced differently in different places um does that mean you know we're going to see more divergence going forwards across different markets and and maybe even across you know investments within a single market yeah i mean we've already seen a huge amount of divergence in just just the US stock market alone i think it ended up in positive double digit territory for the year of 2020 but that was driven by a very small handful of very large tech stocks and then um vast parts of the us index have still very much struggled to recover from the sell off in march so dispersion is already rife within um within markets and and very much expect that to be the case going forward so i, I think there's that means there's scope for active managers to add more value in the future um, but also active management can help mitigate risks as well so the the stock market is incredibly concentrated at the moment it's more concentrated in tech stocks now than it was before the dot-com bubble so um you know i think that thinking through uh, your exposures and having an active manager to bear that in mind uh, is a useful risk management tool as well as a scope for adding value. So I know Katie you're always uh, supportive of active management uh, but you're saying this is this is especially the time for it uh, which I get the point of uh, and finally on that sustainability front uh, the other hot topic is of course inclusion and diversity. Uh, we did, again, talk about IND in a previous episode, but I think it's it's an area where there can definitely be different perspectives. So, I mean, Katie, how, how important is IND to you? It's incredibly important to ensure that, you know, we're getting inputs into our investment portfolio from just the broadest range of um, spectrum of ideas that we can possible because um you know it's very easy for things like groupthink and confirmation bias and all the terminology that you would have heard in relation to the subject but it's very very easy for you to get comfortable and ingrained in the way that you think about the world and therefore challenge is important and having an i and d lens on on how you organize yourself um how you facilitate discussions um and how you allocate capital is just just incredibly important i think and particularly as we see the pace of change accelerating in the world you need to to reflect that in your decision making processes and the people you include in them so now's a good time for active management but if you're going to do it you know you one of your new year's resolutions should be to make sure that the people making decisions on your behalf are getting all the kind of full range of viewpoints through this IND lens as well so yeah very much I uh, very much get that uh, so thank you very much uh, I think to all three of you for taking us through these themes and, and translating them into uh, investment actions and and finally let's say you know yes we we will make our new year resolutions and adopt all this good thinking in our portfolios how do we then monitor that against how the world actually plays out in practice and and evolve what we do over time because we will turn out to be right uh, and also not so right in different areas yeah well that's a very fortuitous question lock and i thank you for it so <laughs> part of the outlook report is is we've designed three dashboards to monitor these themes we've been talking about today so uh, how the policy shift is evolving and the extent to which that creates more or less inflation risk um, uh, how china's opening up is progressing uh, and also in particular climate change uh, a dashboard for that so you know i would uh, commend them to the house and so i think uh, that's a good time to wrap up this episode so thank you uh, very much guys for your contributions thanks Locke been great yeah thanks very much for having me lot cheers lock um hope you'll have me back again <laughs> yeah certainly will uh, don't worry about it um and the last thing for me to say uh, to our listeners is please do look out for uh, our paper which goes into more detail on the various things that we talked about today uh it's called the outlook 2021 and until next time uh, please do take care you've been listening to a willis towers watson podcast for more information, visit willistowerswatson.com.